Welcome to the Voice of Counseling, presented by the American Counseling Association. This program is hosted by Dr. S. Kent Butler. This week's episode is Medicare, what to expect from the 117th Congress, and features Brian Banks. Welcome to the Voice of Counseling from the American Counseling Association. I'm Dr. S. Kent Butler, and joining us today, Brian Banks. Brian is the Chief Government Affairs and Public Policy Officer for the American Counseling Association. Today, we're exploring Medicare. You ready? How you doing, Brian? I'm doing well, Dr. Butler. Thank you for having me today. Good to see you. Good to see you. So we're going to explore Medicare, it seems, and you're going to tell us a little bit about what you do, how you bring it all together, and how counselors are supported by you and the staff at American Counseling Association. So first, before we even get started, you've been here now at the the university, listen to me, at the American Counseling Association for how long now? Just about three years I've been here. Prior to here, I was with the United States Air Force supporting the secretary. Doing the same type of work. Okay, so for those of of us who are new to the game and who have not had the opportunity to meet Brian Banks, what do you do for the American Counseling Association? How do we get to know who you are and and what you bring to the table? That's a great question, Dr. Butler. Um, When someone asks me what I do, I always tell them that's my job and the people that I work with job to protect the organization. It's our job to ensure that we understand the policies, we understand the laws, we understand the proposals that affect this profession or that may affect this profession. In a sense, we're, we're your detectives. We're looking around at every policy possible through all 50 states, through the U.S. territories, and we rely on the grass, our grassroots, which are members and stakeholders and people that just care about counseling issues, and they help guide us as we go through the several different issues we work on. Today, we're talking about Medicare, but that's not all we do. We focus on issues with school counselors, counselor educators. We have counselors. We work within the federal government with the VA and even the Government Accountability Office, which a lot of counselors aren't familiar with. They actually do hire the the GAO. They hire counselors to actually help their employees on staff um, with issues and concerns that they may have. So in short, I'm I'm looking at the policies and the issues that are going to make a difference or potentially attack this profession and ensure we put our best foot forward with research analysis and and historical perspective, as well as stories that matter to members of Congress, state legislators that can help them fight for us um, in their respected in their respected office. Good, good, good. So I love that part of what you're doing for the organization. So how do counselors get involved and how do they then take part in what you're doing so that they can move the needle forward as well? Absolutely. Well, there's several ways counselors can get involved, and I'm going to tell you a few that are very, very critical to our organization. One, if a counselor was to go to the Government Affairs website on www.counseling.org, go to the Government Affairs website and you click on the Take Action tab. Once you get there, if you were to scroll to the very bottom of that page, anyone, counselor or not, my mom is signed up on this, can put in their name and their address, and they're going to get action alerts from the association, which is going to come directly to their email. So those are issues that we care about as an association for our members. And the member can take two minutes, literally two minutes to respond. Once, and I'm going to give you an example. Say a member wants to respond on Medicare. When that yeah. one person responds, they are actually sending three messages, one to their senator and two to their members of the House of Representatives. And it's just that easy. It's, it's, just, it's just that easy. Another way to get involved is just to just reach out to us. Pick up the phone and call us or email us. We're at, we're at um, advocacy. Our, our email is advocacy at counseling.org. Email us. If you have a question, a concern, you have intel, you just want to know what we're doing, send us an email and we'll respond within 48 hours. Those emails are extremely helpful. Just about any success that we've had has come because we've had members that have been involved in the issue. Whether they know the issue or not, whether they're comfortable or not, we help get them there. So they definitely can rely on us to support them. So that's really good because that's how we have evolved as a profession, I guess, using technology and everything else because before you had to sit down and write a letter and do this and do that. And, and it took a lot of time. So now we have put forth through, the, through our organization, a very 
escape proof, a very easy way to kind of get counselors to be involved and still continue on with their day. Continue on with their day. And listen, we do the work for you. We'll write everything up that you need. We do ask if counselors have a, a very personal story to share that can pull on the heartstrings or provide intel to members of Congress, share those stories. They do make a huge, huge difference. Another thing counselors have to be aware of, and I'm going to use this example in, oh, wow, I guess it was 2018 when we were in New Orleans at conference. A counselor came to me and goes, hey, I'm not a mental health counselor, but I want to help with Medicare. Should I respond to these action alerts? Yes. The answer is yes. And if you are a, a mental health counselor and there's a school counselor issue, you should respond to those action alerts as well. There is strength in, mother, in, in numbers. It gives us, it gives us the, the clout and the credibility that we need as a profession. And it also shows the members on the Hill or in your state legislator that there is a profession out there, people that are constituents that need help and assistance and they are already in the process of helping the constituents in that state. And so they'll listen to us because we are the experts. So I heard you slip in mom there just a little while ago. <laughs> so tell me how, what's your mom do? Is she a counselor, not a counselor? How is she involved? Is she there just because of her son? Or what's going on? How is she, how's she getting these alerts? Well, I'll tell you what, um, not just my mom, but my dad and my brother, my sister-in-law. My sister-in-law is a counselor, but you asked me about my mom. My mom is not a counselor. Uh, my mom is retired. She's well into her 70s. Uh, but in my family, we've always been service-oriented people. My mom was a nurse, um, but she's now, uh, her and my dad both are retired. And of course, they want to help their boys when they can. <laughs> nice, nice. Right. So that's that's a good answer because anybody can get involved in this game because really what it means is getting into the voices of uh, or getting our voices into the um, spheres of our Congress people so that they can do the work Absolutely. that's necessary to move it forward. Absolutely. You're hundred percent right. right. So thanks mom. Cause I know you're watching. Um, <laughs> we appreciate what you're doing for Brian and for our organization. So Brian, 1989 was the last update of the CMS um, made um, for Medicare or to Medicare. Um, first of all, describe CMS so that people understand what that is and so okay. that everybody's on the right page with that. Again, so from 1989. So what is new in the program in 2021 that supports the counseling profession? Okay, perfect. Thank you for that question. So CMS, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, they're a government agency. They are the agency, the, the, the short of it, they're the agency that when you are, when we actually get this bill passed, that are going to approve the bills, right? They're going to get counselors paid. They also look at the, the codes that counselors use, use to actually get reimbursed from Medicare. And of course, they work on Medicaid issues, which some counselors will take advantage of right now, or I shouldn't say take advantage of, utilize um, with their clients. Now, as it pertains to the bill, this bill, um, the, the Mental Health Access Improvement Act, has been around for quite some time. This year, the Senate bill is S828, which stands for Senate, and the bill is 828. It's the 828th bill that was introduced in the Senate, and the Congress bill is House Resolution 432. Um, over the years, there have been progress with this bill, which is, which is actually a great thing. The bill has passed in the House at one, a couple of times, it's passed in the Senate a couple of times, but never at the same time. Right. However, Congress sees the value of this profession. So I'm going to give you two examples, Dr. Butler. So we have uh, federal certified opioid treatment programs across the nation. Okay. Unfortunately, those centers are jam-packed and the staffs there are overworked. Congress, CMS, saw the need to bring in more professions to do the work. The first profession, the profession that they looked to were licensed professional counselors, mental health counselors. So going on now, uh, two, a little over two years, we have mental health counselors, right, that are in these facilities working with clients. And when the work is concluded, the facility is being reimbursed through, guess what, Medicare. Okay. So. As you see, CMS, the federal government, has already said that counselors matter. Their work is efficient and they're experts and they can tap into the Medicare system. The difference is the Medicare funds that come to the facility do not go to the counselor for their for the services rendered. Right. It goes to the facility. So that, that so, go ahead, please. How do we get Congress and others to, to recognize that this is a dilemma maybe, uh, especially with regards to counselors, because we do see 
or feel as though we're invisible to society um, with regards to the, not only the services that we offer, but how they view us um, with regards to what we do for the mental, mental health, um, I guess the field and for, for our, our clients. Right, exactly, exactly. So the reality of it now, um, the good, the bad, the ugly in our country right now has led Congress to say, you know, well, we have a mental health crisis okay. and we need to find a way to solve this problem. So here's the good of it. Many of the members, if not all of the members on Capitol Hill that the American Council Association has talked to, and we've spoken to hundreds, agree with us when we talk about Medicare. They agree that there's a need to, to de de increase access uh, to, to clients, and they understand that counselors are well-trained and they pretty much do the same work um, as a social worker. And quite frankly, they know that counselors, when it comes to clinical training, have more training for the most part throughout the country and in the states. And so they look at it as a profession that needs to be within the program. Here's, here's a problem that Congress faces, and it's, it's, it's kind of a two-prong problem here. When you look at the conservatives on Capitol Hill, they need to have a more business argument on why this bill should pass. They're concerned about the cost of the bill, quite frankly. This bill, uh, the, the score in this bill, when I say the score, it means the cost for anyone that, that's listening, right. which is done by the Congressional Budget Office. They get a bill, they read through it, and then what they won't tell you, or a lot of people don't know, mental health bills, they usually start at $1 billion, right? And that's where they usually start. This bill will cost one5 to $1.6 over a 10 year time period. So when, when a Republican looks at that and then they look at the state of Medicare today, it concerns them because they see it as money that the federal government may not have in the future to fund this program. But that's okay, because they've asked so you, us. You, you specifically said Republican. Um, is there a reason why you specifically said Republican? In this case, yes, there is. Um, I'll tell you this, two of our strongest sponsors, um, especially our, our Senate sponsor, uh, Senator Barrasso, and we also have um, Representative Katko, um, Republican Party, they support this bill and they're very, very well respected. But when you look at the conservative side of the aisle, they want to save money and they want to make sure they're making money for this country. And being that the Medicare program is, is sort of in flux and people don't know what's going to happen, they believe the program's running out of money, it, it does concern them. Mm -hmm. And so they're looking for innovative ways to save money and to move this program forward. So right. that's what ACA did, um, Dr. Butler. We have a brand new document online. It's a Medicare brief. And we also have a summary of that brief online on, on the ACA website, which explains how the federal government can actually save money through the Medicare program when they let counselors in the program. So, so we're doing our job and we're continuing to sell that story um, right. to make a difference for the profession. So I, I just find it funny, you know, maybe you can kind of walk me through this, um, being in the policy the way that you are. Um, I've always heard that, you know, this costs too much money and, they, and you're punting it down the road a little bit and it's going to cost money for, it's going to hurt our children and those um, types of individuals. I'm of the mindset that, you know, every year since government has been in existence, they've been putting it down the road to the future generation. And so how does that stick? How does that <clears throat> mantra of, you know, we're going to be um, putting this pressure on future generations to pay this bill down really kind of stick when in all actuality, we're, we're all doing it. Every generation has paying back um, or doing something to pay off something that future uh, or past um, iterations of Congress have kind of put forward. Help that's, me understand that. That's a great question. So I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, I have worked in healthcare, education, um, gaming, all type of different issues um, for and, and working with Congress. So when you look at Congress, they do their best work when they compromise and when they work together on issues. Okay. We're in a new place right now where there's a lot of concern and quite frankly, there's a lack of people compromising. So um, when you talk about over the years, a bill like this, when you have a mental health bill or health care bill, it's going to cost, it's a pay for, it's going to cost, so you have to find money from somewhere to pay for it. The concern is where do we find this money? 
Well, here's the reality. I told, I told you earlier, I worked for the Air Force. When I worked for the Air Force, there is a, the National Defense Authorization Act. People don't know that they're, in that bill, there's money for the counseling or the mental health profession and counselors do take advantage of it. But that bill is, it's, it's oh my gosh. I can't remember the exact amount, but it's not even close to what we're, this 1.5, 1.6, it's, it's well beyond that. Okay. And so it's a priority of Congress and what they really want to, to fund. Also, over the years, this bill, and I'm going to be really blunt here when I say this, this is a bill that's a little different because if you looked at a bill, and I don't have a bill number in it right now for the psychologists or the social workers, they may want to add something to Medicare. Maybe they believe they need to have an increased payment. And I'm not arguing for or against what they want to do. They're very good professions and we have to work together. But then you look at the, the Medicare bill, it's a bill that actually combines professions. And so you have counselors are included in this bill, as well as the marriage and family therapists in this bill. So essentially, when you look at the cost, which, which many conservatives are concerned about, having two professions in that bill is going to increase the score. So that's a challenge as well. So currently, what we have to do is work together with those groups to ensure that we're telling the appropriate sto story and where we're empowering these members with the information they need. So we talked about the, the Republicans, the conservative side, but, you know, there's some conservative Democrats as well. But a lot of times with the Democrats, and, and I don't want to, I, I used to work on Capitol Hill for a little while. I'm, I, I don't want an infinity one, but you have to pull on the heartstrings of the Democrat and tell the story that relates to the constituent for them to understand and get it and see the need for it. But quite mm -hmm. frankly, there's some Democrats on the Hill as well that are concerned about the cost. And they're, they're actually doing the right thing. They have to show that concern because they're supporting their state, right, right. As, as well as the country. It's our job to ensure that we're empowering them with the most, uh, the best research and the best analysis to show them how this bill, especially in the House, how it's going to help their constituents, in the Senate, how it's going to help their constituents as well, and also how it's going to help the nation. Um, we're part of the uh, Medicare coalition. In that group, we have uh, national groups like um, the, the uh, I'm trying to think, NBCC is a part of the group. I'm trying to think of groups that counselors would know. We right. have um, aging groups in Oregon. They're a small group in Oregon that has an association on aging. They're part of the group. And so, and there's several other people as well. So we come together to make sure that we can step, tell the story in, the, in an effective way. Last thing, the most effective that we've had at ACA is really going back to the grassroots, which are our members and the people engaging, whether it's sending those letters, those action alerts, or actually coming to meetings with ACA, which I should have mentioned earlier. So I apologize to the listeners. We need your help. So you, yes. we, we send requests out to members to come with us to these meetings when they're all virtual now, so it's much easier to do, to meet with your legislators and to meet with the staffers and tell your stories. That makes a huge difference and it does help push the needle forward. Right. So, so I get it, but I don't buy it when it comes <laughs> to the whole thing about, you know, all this money that's going to be put on future generations. Um, and the reason why is because, like I said earlier, we're, we're always going to be paying down the debt. I mean, mm -hmm. they, nobody has proved to me that there was ever a time that there, we weren't paying down the debt. So is there another approach to getting to these individuals? And because and, I think that sometimes they're just playing a, a political game. Yeah. And, you know, they get what they want, they'll, they'll go for it. If they don't get what they want, then they won't go for it. But Mental health and how people are surviving in this world is so extremely important. To play political games with it is, is I believe, uh, a malpractice on the, on, the, on the parts of these senators and, and representatives who are doing this work on behalf of all of us here in, in the U.S. And I think that when I see those types of things happening, playing um, with people's lives in the manner in which they, I see that I'm doing that. There's got to be some kind of a, accountability, something. When, where are the adults in the room that stops this bad behavior of people not really caring for the citizens who really truly need our, um, their support and their help? Yeah, that's, you bring up a lot of good points. And I, I think we could do a, another hour of this to talk about the, the adults in the room. But I'll tell you this. Um, you bring up some really good points, and I'm trying to go through several of them fairly quickly. So just stop me if you need a clarification. Sure. With our members, it's one thing for me to say, let's do our action alerts, come to me to meetings. 
But another thing that we have to do is as a community, a counseling community, we need to be more involved. And I'm not saying every person needs to hop on a plane when it's, when it's safe to come to DC and go to Capitol Hill. Every weekend, just about every weekend, the members fly home. And when they fly home, they're, they're doing town hall meetings, they're giving updates on their agenda to their community and public forums. We need to be able to attend those meetings. How do you learn okay. about those meetings? You simply go to the website of that member and you can Google their name. And if you don't know who they are, you just Google your address and say member of Congress, member of the state legislator, and it will pop up. Go to their website and you can sign up for the updates and you'll receive all of those updates. Our voices need to be heard on Capitol Hill mm -hmm. as well as at home. That makes a huge difference. Also, uh, I'm, I'm not a huge campaign guy when it comes to working campaigns and vote for this person. Um, I've done that before. Not my cup of tea. However, <laughs> it's very, very important. It is critical for our members to know that campaigns can take place by an individual at home. And you don't have to worry about voting for a person. Go to the person that's already won. Speak to them about this issue and let them know who you are as a person so they'll know they have an expert that will fight for them and help them be a voice. We have to help them make the right decisions. And, right. and I'll say this, the last thing I'll say is if they're not being accountable, holding themselves accountable and being responsible as a nation, we need to hold them responsible and vote them out of office and get some other people office. in there. And, and I have to do this, Mr. Butler, Dr. Butler, one last thing, one last thing. Sure. Counselors, there's an opportunity to run for office. There's an opportunity to be a part of the school board. There's an opportunity to sit on your license board. Yes. Be a part of the conversation. Say it louder for the people in the back. Say it louder for the people in the back. Right, right. Yep. <laughs> You're right, Dr. Butler. Yeah. And I think that that's really important because I think one of the misnomers that I think counselors sometimes think of is the only thing that they really do is just sit in a counseling room and counsel. Mm. And the social justice advocacy part is so important in terms of getting out there, getting in, in the faces of our legislators and, and doing the hard work um, that's necessary to, to help move the needle. Because it could be that compelling voice that the person finally hears that is able to push the needle a little bit further in terms of them then taking a stance that's for the right thing to do, right? And, and right. that's really what we're hoping and looking for them to be able to do is to do the right thing for the citizens. Um, and not because of some type of lobbying or something that's going on that's stopping the process. So right. another question I have for you in regards to Medicare <laughs> goes with reimbursement. Um, Medicare reimbursement is important to, the, to counselors. How should the profession go about informing Congress of the need for this bill to become a law? Okay, that's, that's a great question. When you, when you look at this bill, well, you know what? Let me just say this. Members of Congress need to know how this affects them at home. Okay. So ACA, we have a list of every single state in the nation. We have how many mental health counselors are there, how many marriage and family therapists, so on and so forth. We have to be able to share these numbers with them. A lot of the states that have the, the, an, an urgent need for problems are people that are in rural areas. The majority of professions in rural areas, mental health professions, I have to say, are mental health counselors. There are people that live in wherever in Wyoming that if they don't get a service from a counselor, they're not going to get it from anywhere else unless they drive two or three hours. You have to remember these people that are going through this issue, they're disabled. They may have caretakers in the house. But Dr. Butler, sometimes there are people just like you and I, we're, we're working every day, working hard every day, uh, but they may not have the money in some cases to, for transportation. And so we to, to get two or three hours. And so we need to make sure members know what's happening in their so district. Will, will there be support for telemental health as well within this regards, or, or is that something that's too far on the horizon? We, that's, that's a really good question. Um, moving through the, the counseling compact, once we get there, there'll definitely be support across the board, which is, which is great news. We're moving in the right direction there. This bill doesn't necessarily focus on telehealth. It just focuses on the Medicare piece. Now down the road, say the counseling compact didn't work, which it will work, everyone that's listening in, we're moving in the right direction. If it didn't work, we can work with Congress to ensure that that's happening. There are countless bills. In the last check, there were 300, 400 bills focused on telehealth right now. So members of Congress are getting it. The challenge that they're facing right now is that besides the debt ceiling, there are about five or six other bills that they need to get passed between October 15th and the end of the month. 
they have already said to us and to others that we are going to put together a mental health package the end of the year around the holidays or going into the next year. And so it's our job right now to ensure that we're included in that package. Right. So, that, so that's a good question to ask you right now, then, because you just brought up something that made me think package. Why does everything have to be inserted in a package? Why can't they stand alone? OK, that's that's a good question. That's a good question. I'm going to give you a, a really what's going to seem like an odd example. My wife sent me to the grocery store this weekend and some items that she forgot to pick up. So I'm like, oh, babe, I'll go get I'll get the items. And I didn't take a, I didn't take a list with me. I just put it in my head, didn't put it in my phone. And when I brought them back home, she looked through and I missed two or three things. And she was like, you just need to have them all in there. Without these items, I can't make this entire dish, right? And we were cooking something together, so Filipino dish. Um, but, but anyway, with Congress, you can have a bill that's by itself that has a lot of support or a little bit of support in some cases, and the bill would just kind of sit there and hang out. If there are a lot of bills, say there's a telehealth bill and a Medicare bill, and the bill focus on um, access for veterans beyond the VA to use the counseling profession, the mental health profession. You combine all those bills, it becomes more attractive to a lot of congressional members to, to say, you know what, I want to lobby for this bill internally. On the but it also process. increases yes. the, the 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 amount of money that will go towards the debt ceiling, right? So I in mean, some cases, in. Right. In some in some cases, that's true, um, but not in all cases. So, for example, if we connected uh, a telehealth bill, right, telehealth is going to cost one way or the other, um, or, or we have something to do with Medicaid, it's going to cost one way or the other, but those funds are there, and they're going to be there on an annual basis. Congress is going to pass those funds annually. They have to do so. And so you combine those bills, and it gives an opportunity to say, this is what needs to happen so those bills can pass. Through that process, there is a lot of negotiation happening. So there's some, some things that will be pulled out or bits and pieces of bills that will be pulled out to actually lower the cost of the bill, the total okay. bill. All right. And so they, I guess, are doing their fiduciary responsibility to the government. But there are some things that seem to get passed without a moment's notice. And then there are things that, like, again, like I'm going back, I'm harping on this, but I'm talking mm -hmm. about healthcare. I'm talking about people right. who need to be able to be okay, to be able to see individuals, to be able to have services that are necessary. Yet, those are the things that we keep getting pushed away, pushed away from. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, how come, and we could probably talk about this after the break, but okay. how come when it comes to the welfare of American citizens, um, we have to fight so hard? It's a good, you want me to answer now or we're going to wait to break? Uh, you can start the answer now. I'll start. Okay. Well, you know what? Um, that's, it's, that's a really good question. It's, it's also a difficult one to answer. Um, we know the, the, the role of Congress is to pass a balanced budget on an annual basis. That's their only role, right? Everything else is secondary. And in that process, congressmen, senators, they have to make a decision of what they're going to support and what they value the most. We talk about Medicare today. The Senate, our Senate leaders, Barroso, as well as Stabenow has already made our bill their number one priority. But Russell's made us a number one priority. Um, uh, Stabenow, who has several mental health bills, has put it on our prior priority list. So that's a good sign for us in the Senate. We need our bills to continue to become a priority. As a healthcare in the nation, quite frankly, and maybe this is more personal to me on the personal side of me, um, it's been a disaster in so many ways, right? There are people that don't have health care. There's nations that people will say aren't as great as America, but everyone has health care and their health care is paid for. And the health care includes mental health care. So there's some issues as a nation that we need to work on. There's no doubt about it. There's some mm -hmm. members on the Hill that get that. There's others that need that education and they need to hear from right. their constituents. to improve. Uh, So, so we'll, we'll, we'll get back to this in a few minutes, but I want you to think about this as well. Has the pandemic helped in any way to let Good Congress question. know that people's mental wellness is in check or in, in, in need of some check. It's a good question. I'm looking forward to answering that one after the break for All sure. Right. So let's do this after the break. Uh, thank you. This has been um, a great first half of our conversation with, with Brian Banks on how we can work on Medicare and other things with Congress. Um, we'll be back. This is the Voice of Counseling. We'll be back in a moment. Counselors help positively impact lives by providing support, 
wellness. Treatment. We're working to change lives. We are creating a world where every person has access to the quality, professional counseling, and mental health services needed to thrive. Welcome back. I'm S. Ken Butler, and we're continuing the conversation with Brian Banks from ACA. We left off talking about the pandemic and how it has affected the mental wellness of our, of our counseling clients. And so, Brian, how has it affected Congress and, and their look at um, maybe passing some of this legislation? It's, it has affected Congress. Congress sees the need. They, they look at health care, uh, more health care and mental health is within that scope as something that they have to take serious because you know what, they're hearing more from their constituents and they're also are hearing horror stories. And quite frankly, they're looking at statistics and seeing that there's some issues that are happening in their states and around this country that needs, mm. to, needs to be invo- avoided. Um, yeah. when, when you look at telehealth, for example, people will look at telehealth as, oh, we don't think that's that important in, in some states and in other states. Oh yeah, we need to actually make this happen. Now they're looking at it, mem- many members on the Hill, as well as in the state legislature, are saying we have to move this forward. Mm. Not too long ago, a month or maybe two months ago, someone was telling me a story about a client that they were seeing. And this client was at home sick with COVID. This person lives alone, needed to speak to their counselor, and couldn't leave the house because they had COVID. So without right. telehealth, this person who was having some pretty just major issues would have, would have quite frankly, had suffered. Right. And who knows what this person would have had to turn to. And then you look at our nation. Just recently, numbers came out that suicide is actually um, decreasing in the armed services. But I also spoke to a member who works for the Army, is a counselor with the Army. And we had a meeting scheduled because, Brian, I can't speak to you today. Two of our members just committed suicide. Now, I can't tell you what was going on. With died them. by suicide. Died, yes, died by suicide, right? I can't tell you what was going on with the two people. But the reality is we're seeing a lot of people just unsure and people are literally asking for help and assistance. And COVID has not just, and this may sound bad, Dr. Butler, COVID has helped us tell our argument. Um, we all want COVID to go away, but it put people on notice that we need to do. It really exposed a lot of disparities. Right. um, Exactly. In in many communities, not just in um, black and brown communities, but in communities around it showed cases um, just what has really been happening in our healthcare system and just how we have been kind of bamboozled uh, in a way by, by people who will kind of keep us at bay so that they don't have to worry about, um, the rising cost of, of health care. Right, exactly, exactly. And health care, it, it's expensive, right? It, it's extremely expensive. And the reality is I, I, I'm an advocate for when you look at Medicare, or just health care in general. I'll give an example. I just had a physical exam, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> why not? And, and, I, and I'm sure you've heard this in your position. Why not have a mental health exam on an annual basis for everyone across the nation, right? I'm an advocate for that. And I know there's some people on Capitol Hill that would definitely support that. Uh, Mm -hmm. But this this country is one where we look at the insurance companies and so much dollars and cents involved, and there's debate and there's people donating certain amounts to members that it it kind of, the water gets a little, um, a little, uh, I don't want to say dirty, but it gets a little dirty at times, right? And so you really- I like to use the word messy. I think we can say like messy. I, messy. I like that. I like that. Right. So yeah. listen, Doc, we, we need to clean up our mess. Right. Yes. We need to clean up our mess. We have great minds in this country. We have great minds in this profession. We, we have policy that has moved forward, that has made a difference. And so mm-hmm. we need to make sure that we are helping the Congress understand this policy. I'm, go, did you have another question? I don't have a question, but I'm sitting here okay. thinking, you know, one of the things is that's why it's so important to get out and, do the, and vote. That's why it's so important to find people who are like minded and putting them into office. That's why it's important for counselors to go out there. And if they have the mindset to be Congress individuals, to go out and do that, because what's really happening is the need for these types of voices to be heard. And as long as we keep suppressing that voice, right, that's what's happening with the the voter suppression. That's what's happening with the gerrymandering that's going on. There are people who are in positions of power who want to stay there, but don't see the best interests of 
all of us as Americans. They only are staying there so that their services or their um, way of living can stay on the, at the top of the pecking order. And right. so we need to find some way, find a way to, to kind of relieve them of their posts, right? And, and it comes from these type of legislative actions. It's being aware of who's really standing in your corner and who really doesn't think much about you or your life or how you exist or how you right. live. Exactly, exactly. You know, un unfortunately, some people have to get uncomfortable before they can get comfortable. They have to be affected directly um, before they want to take action. But the reality is, as, as you said, we have the power of the vote. We can vote people out. But I truly believe counselors need to take, and there are counselors out there that are in office, by the way, or that have been in office, but we need to take the opportunity to continue that process of running for office, getting appointed to offices by governors in the state. Not too long ago, ACA did, a, it's, on, it's, on, it's on our YouTube channel on um, how to actually get elected to office. So we have oh, okay. a resource out there for our counselors if they would like to use it. Just visit the ACA YouTube channel and it's there. And if you have qu more questions, call us. We'll, we'll direct you to it or guide you to where you need to go within your state to get Well, I think a lot of times people are private and they don't want their personal life on display. And I get that, I understand that. But sometimes we have to take the heavy hit, right? We have to, you know, pick one for the team and say, you know what? I'm living a just life. I'm living a good life. I need to put myself out there and be able to stand up and stand for those people who have been marginalized, who have been mm -hmm. oppressed, who have not right. been able to have their voices heard. And, you know, we can go and stomp the yard all we want, but the fact of the matter is, unless we have people who are committed to the, the welfare of the human nature of individuals and human beings who are living here in our society, we're not gonna necessarily move the needle. And, right. uh, and, and again, like I said, that's where it goes back to me saying, where are the adults in the room, right? There's so much bad behavior going on that at least it's obvious to me that it's bad behavior, yet they continue to, to still stay in positions of power. And, and, and you just wonder well, what, what is in that? What is stopping that from moving forward? Mm -hmm. um, and, you, and we know, right? Again, it goes with the gerrymandering, it goes with the voter suppression, it goes with bullying and scaring people from going out and vote. It goes, it goes with all of that um, so that people can stay in power. But we have to be more powerful than that narrative. We have You're to right. find ways that we can circumvent that system so that people who are doing wrong in, in Congress and anywhere else um, get, get unseated. Right. You're absolutely right. And, and another part of that that I think is extremely important is people need to advocate in their communities. Yes. And, and this is usually a very easy job to do and people don't realize how easy it can be. And I'm going to give you an example. Mm -hmm. I am a, in a pretty big neighborhood. I live on a street called Fox Hill Lane. Just about every weekend, people. I, I don't want to give out that information to everybody, brother. Do you? That, that, that's what they, it's Fox Hill Lane all across the nation. Okay. If they want to come by, come, come on, come on by. I'll teach you a thing or two. <laughs> but we stand on the corner every weekend, my neighbors and I, and, and we're, there's a diverse group of people, age, ethnic background, and we sit and we talk about all of the issues that are going on and what we need to do to help improve this or whatever it needs to be. And then we actually get together and we take action because we're involved in our community. We know right. our local officials by first name. We know our state officials by first name. I know my congressman by first name. You right. don't have to know them by first name, but you just need to know where to go to take action and to get together with your neighbors so you can educate them. So does that take a special person though? I mean, I'm, I'm listening to you. Um, we can have these conversations. A lot of times people have the one-offs, right? Mm -hmm. I can have this great conversation with you and then I go on about my business and I, you know, I don't think about it anymore. How do we get people to stay connected? How do we stay, get people to kind of continue on with that energy that's necessary? I guess it's locking arms with people who are like-minded, but you don't want people to fall off by the wayside. So how do you get people to stay involved? Because it is difficult. And you know, a lot of times what people do when it gets difficult is they, they tune out or they move they, away from They it. tune out and, and, and a lot of times they're aware, but they just tune out. But here, here's, here's what you have to do, in my opinion. You have to meet people where they are. Okay. Right. I, I, I was had a, a great fortune to sit on a committee years back at a, a university in D.C. And it was uh, an alignment between Africa and the United States. And they were um, um, 
doctors from the United States, students were going to Africa and vice versa. And it was at the very beginning stages of the program. And I said at the very beginning, it was two years in. And one of the gentlemen from Africa, I'll never forget this. He stood up and says, I want to tell you all a story. He says, when I come home from work, my daughter runs to the door and she gives me a hug and says, hey, daddy, I'm so glad you're home. And he said, here, there's his wife. And she kisses her. And she always runs to the refrigerator and she opens it up and says, daddy, what's for dinner? And all he sees is that bright light, right? That bright light is just people talking. Right. And after people have a long day every day, they need to see more than that bright light, that empty refrigerator. They need to see some substance and they need to know that there are people that, around them that they can rely on. You don't always have to be the out front person in the voice, but everyone has some story to tell. So if they can help us know what that story is. We can tell it for them. I love going out and talking to people and learning about people and researching and analyzing the issues and then bringing it all together to go mm -hmm. to wherever I need to go across this country to make a difference. One of the best things I saw as a member, as a staff person at the association is when Michigan went on attack against counselors and not being able to, to bill insurance. And Rich, our CEO, sent, sent me up there to, to do my thing, to talk to counselors and to talk to the board. And when I got there, it was amazing that the people there knew whether they were with ACA as a member or not, they knew I was coming. They talked to me. They told stories. I had people of all ages like, this is not my thing. I don't like getting up talking, but this really matters. I have to make a difference. It meant something to them. It's our job to show them at times that it's not that difficult to tell your story. Nobody knows your story better than you. Right. right. And if you always do what you always done, you always get what you always got. <laughs> uh, one, one of my football coaches in college would tell me that and he was always right. So we perform at a high level, get with the right people that we need to talk to or just send the right email or drop a call or whatever it needs, whatever you can do to make a difference. Do it. There are people out here that will carry the water for you, but we need your help and your support. And, and, and quite frankly, I'm going to be honest here. When you look at state government, things move fast. You look at the federal government, in some cases, things move fast, but those are the things that have to pass every single year or there's a tragedy. And so we have to do something immediately so we can so people are happy. But the reality is federal government moves slow and people get tired of it. They get bored with it. They get angry with it. They get frustrated with it. And I'm going to be honest with you. So do I working in this profession for 22, 23, 24 years now. Actually, right. I get tired of it. And I right. get frustrated. You forgot one thing, though, that they play games with it, too. They will they will play games with it. And a lot of the games, Dr. Butler, a lot of the games is the talk to the media, but then yeah. behind the scenes, something different is happening. Yeah. I went to a senator's office a, a while back. I was working on environmental issues. And this senator, a very well respected one, said to me, Brian, I'm with you, but my people aren't. So you need to get my people in here to talk to me. And that was the message I needed to hear. So we marched on up to Maine. We marched on up to Connecticut. We talked to a lot of different people and we got members to talk to her and we made some change happen on a bill that quite frankly, it was they were pushing 20 years to try to get something passed. And she was able to step up with a Republican party and bring along some Democrats across the aisle to make sure a bill got passed. Um, but really for the policy, a lot of policy is local. And I would say start at the local level, know what's going on read your newspaper, talk to your neighbors, but really read and analyze. Don't allow people to tell you what's happening without having the facts. Go find them for yourself. Right. Our organization is going to help you find those facts. And we're going to give it to you straight, whether it's good or not good, because we need your support right. to make change. Right. And I think you, you, you're right. And you have to open up your, your, your pathway to be able to find these facts in multiple fashions, not just coming from ACA, but also coming from other facts factions of life so that you can discern what's best for yourself and what's best for moving forward. And that's not meaning that, you know, you shouldn't listen to ACA because I think <laughs> that's what we want. We, we're doing this on behalf of counselors, right? right? So we're hoping that we're putting our best foot forward for counselors. But the truth of the matter is that you have to also have a passion for what you want out of this as well. I think that also keeps you involved, right? And so, yes, you can walk lack step with ACA right into the um, your legislator's office and have all the right things to say. But if your heart's not there, then you're probably not going to stick with it and stay with it. It's like that pin you have on your on, on your lapel there. It mm -hmm. talks about power. And I think, you know, what thing that I believe in is just power in numbers. And so you have to find some way to 
to, to lock arms with people who are like-minded, who can give you the energy to continue to fight and, and to get this thing done, get it taken care of so that we can, we can really um, change the way the world views mental wellness and mental health. Right, right. We have to live to fight another day and we can do it working together. You know, I was in a conversation with a group of people that do the same type of work. They don't work for ACA. And we were discussing an issue that we believe is going to come up next year. And a, a big part of the group, half of the group, I'll say close to 50 percent of the group didn't want to discuss the issue. And so what I say to the group, I say, look, we know the chances are probably 90 percent or above is going to come up. It's better right. for us now to be prepared for that issue mm -hmm. because it's gonna give us the strength, the power, the credibility to get the information to the people that need it, the, the, the congressional staffers, certain members on the Hill, so they can review it, ask all their questions now, we will answer right. those questions right. and then they can advocate for them, right? So, right. so same, same thing in your community. I have a couple of neighbors next door, we're friends. They'll come over and they'll talk about a lot of issues. They're not into the whole politics thing. They're voters and, and all that, but they could care less. But they'll come over and talk about those issues. And I'll say, look, here's my opinion. And here's what I think is going to happen. But what you should also do, and this is something that we didn't hit on during this conversation. So I want to throw it in there. If there's something that you disagree with, you don't like, you feel needs to be done, those matter too. And you need to speak up on those issues because the right people may not be aware of them. And you may be the key to changing that issue just by speaking up. Some right. people don't have the, the um, it's who they are. It's built into them to not to be out front and to not right. speak up on the issues. My grandmother right. was a very quiet woman. But if when she spoke, you better believe people listen. Because she knew, to, to me, she knew everything. Right. But she knew, um, she had a lot of good information and knowledge. And because of that, right. she's from D.C., she helped change some policy in the city. I'm a very quiet woman who wanted to be behind the scenes. It just has to take someone that right. wants so to Right, so helping them to kind of cultivate their role, no matter what that role is. You should push somebody in the forefront if they are behind the scenes grassroots workers. So I get that. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. So um, I, got a, I, got, I got something I want to ask you. Okay. So um, how would you make this statement stronger, right? Because maybe it's a way that we advocate for our profession. Don't just get mad or be mad, but be strategic. How, how, will we, how can we tweak that so that it makes, it makes so much more sense? Oh, that's a good one. You're putting me on the spot with that one. I, I'll tell you what. I think, I'm not, I, I know that strategy makes a difference, right? Okay. And I would say with, with that quote you just gave me is to be smart, be strategic, and take action, right? Because you can be smart and strategic, but if you don't take action, nothing is going to happen. No one's going to tell you what's working and what's not working, right? But if you take the action, people will literally come to you and go, like, mm, you shouldn't do it this way. You should do it this way because, and they're going to give you the intel that they have. So just taking an opportunity to be intelligent in that conversation will allow people to want to come to you and help and support you, whether they agree or not. And my job, it's very important to say this, and on the PPLC, the Public Policy and Legislative Committee, we have people that are Democrats, Republicans, independent, or whatever, right? But the reality is we have to work with everyone. And it starts with being smart, intelligent, using a strategy, and taking action. We're not going to all, I'm going to speak for myself, I'm not always going to take the right action, but I am going right. to take the most strategic, right? right. And I'm going to learn from it and do the right thing for this organization. Right. So I, what I sense you saying is like, take mad out of the equation. You know, it's not enough to be mad because people can look at you all day and say, hey, yeah, you're mad, but guess what? I have the power and so I'm gonna move forward. So you're saying be smart, be strategic. Right, and take, and take action. action. Listen, you, you can be mad. If you wanna be mad, you can be mad. And listen, I, I get frustrated and angry about a lot of things that are happening in this world, right? But the reality is when you go speak to a member, they may have those same feelings. Now they need help because the, the, the people that we vote for, very smart and very intelligent people, their staffers are extremely smart and extremely intelligent. They don't know these issues like we know. them. So we have to yeah. provide them that information. I have a friend who's a state legislator, a powerful state legislator, and I was going to speak to him. The session was in, in in the state of Maryland. I was just going to go say, hey, what's up? And he came to me, he was, Brian, are you coming to advocate today? Are you coming to educate and empower me today? 
And I said, I'm just coming to say hello, but you know, I'm going to educate and empower you before I leave. He goes, because I'm tired of hearing from the advocates. And what he meant by that, and he was, he was actually being sincere. What he meant by that is the people banging on his door, requesting meetings, and they were coming and telling him what to do and how to do it. And why are you taking so long? What he really needed to hear was like, hey, what is your issue? How does this issue affect my constituents? And what can I do to help you? Tell me what actions I need to take because he didn't know he needed to hear from experts. And so he we have to be them to meet them. Meet you come in here and meet me where I am, as opposed to trying to tell me what I should be doing. I, I love right. that. Right. I love and that. Under, exactly. And understand this. And, and this is very important for counselors to know. And, and I hope they get this. The counselor has more power. Right. Than the legislator. The legislator needs you more than you need them. And you have wow. to show them that you are an expert in your field and yes. that you can support them along the way. Excellent. So it, it, it's, 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 um, it takes time to build those relationships, but once you mm -hmm. build them, those legislators will start calling you and asking you for some, the support that they need. Well, Brian, we have to leave it there. And uh, I will take those words that you have shared, um, I think as words of wisdom, for sure. Smart, strategic, take action. Absolutely. There's a hashtag in there somewhere um, that Let's we can kind of put <laughs> forward. But thank you so much for your time. I think you've shared so much that we can do as a counseling community to move the needle when it comes to how we are going to change the narrative of those who are in need of Medicare and our services. So thank you so much. This has been the Voice of Counseling. I'm Dr. S. Kent Butler. I've been here today with Brian D. Banks. And we had a good time talking about Medicare. And so we'll see you next time. This is the Voice of Counseling coming to you straight from the American Counseling Association. Have a phenomenal day. ACA provides these podcasts solely for informational and educational purposes. Opinions expressed in these podcasts do not necessarily reflect the view of ACA. ACA is not responsible for the consequences of any decisions or actions taken in reliance upon or as a result of the information and resources provided in this program. This program is copyright 2021 by the American Counseling Association. All rights reserved.